Okay, so in the previous lectures, we've developed a finite element approximation for the total Lagrangian formulation. We've also talked about how to um, assemble from the, the element level equations to the global set of equations. Uh, and when we had done that, let me remind you what our um, discretized momentum equation was. So let me say recall. Uh, the discretized momentum equation leads to the following, where we had some mass matrix M times the nodal acceleration vector U double dot was equal to the uh, external force vector minus the internal force vector was equal to the net force vector, we'll call F, right? Let's call that equation one. So that's what we had arrived at. So here what we want to do is we want to develop a solution approach. So in this case, we're going to develop an explicit central difference uh, time integration to solve this uh, set of equations. So how do we do that? Well, let's begin with time t equals zero. And we're going to use uh, time steps delta t uh, we're going to discretize time uh, such that we would say that t is equal to n times delta t, where n is our step number. Okay, and we'll call this equation 2. And what that means is that if I want to, I'm going to uh, use some superscripts now. So for example, my displacement vector, let's call this u sub n, that's going to be equal to, that's u, right, evaluated at the time uh, n times delta t, right? That's just my notation, okay? Let's call that equation 3, just again for definition. I think it makes sense, but just so you know where we're at, okay? So what we're going to do, I'm going to give you the definitions here. But we're going to approximate our velocities at half time step values. So what that means is that we would write u dot of n plus one half, right? Okay. And we would call that uh, the velocity n plus one half, right? Is going to be equal to uh, u n plus 1 minus u n divided by delta t. Okay, let's call that equation 4. So what that means is that if we knew this velocity term, we could write the u n plus 1 term. Okay, so we could write that then u of n plus 1 uh, is going to be equal to uh, u of n, right, uh, plus v of n plus one half times delta t. Call that equation five. Okay, accelerations at some time step n are given as follows. We'll say u double dot of at n. That's just our acceleration vector, call it a at time step n. And that's going to be equal to our uh, velocity vector at m plus one half, right, minus the velocity vector at n minus one half. Okay? Divided by delta t. Let's call that equation six. So that, so that now lets us write this uh, velocity of n plus one half, which we need in equation four and in equation five, right, in terms of the acceleration. So we would write v n plus one half is going to be equal to v n minus one half uh, plus a n times delta t. Let's call that equation 7. OK, 
Okay. Let me give you a, a, a note here. Obviously, we have a problem. If what if n equals zero, then we have v to the minus one half. So let me just say, uh, here's your note. Right. If n is equal to zero, so it's our very first step. Right. Then we'll then we're going to uh, just use a one-sided derivative uh, such that. We would write then that this first term v one half, right? So this is when n equals zero, is equal to uh, v naught, the initial velocity, uh, plus one half a naught times delta t, right? And so let's call that equation eight. So this is the case. This is what how you get that first half velocity term. Okay. So now how do we get the acceleration? So go back to the original equation that we had and we can compute it just by solving that, right? So the value of the acceleration can be computed as just acceleration time step n is equal to the inverse of the mass matrix times that net force vector f sub n, or, or fn, right, the, that time step n. Let's call that equation 9. Okay, and I will just point out, remember we talked about previously that this mass matrix is not time dependent. Okay, so we only need to uh, solve for this, this inverse problem once. We can use it for the rest of the time. Okay, so I know that it may, maybe it seems a little... Um, unclear how to apply these in the right steps. So, so now I've given you the definitions of everything. I'm going to tell you what, how we apply this in a complete solution procedure if we wanted to code it up. So the complete solution procedure is then, okay, step one, All right? This is just the initialization. So we have uh, initial conditions and initialization. Okay. And so in this case, we'll just set right, the initial velocity, v naught, um, and we also have some initial stress or force term, call that sigma naught, right, and we also have set n equal to zero and t equal to zero, right, so those are our initial, initial conditions. The other thing we can do is we can go ahead and compute the mass matrix, right, uh, and I'll just say also n m inverse, okay. Step two, first thing we want to do in this is we want to go ahead and compute that force vector Fn. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, this we do this in about seven steps. So uh, to bear with me as we work through these. The first thing that we need to do is we need to uh, uh, determine all of the nodal displacements and velocities from the initial displacement, from the global displacement and velocity vector. Okay, so we want to determine UE and VE, or displacements and uh, velocity of the, uh, at the element points, uh, from our global vector U and global vector V. Okay? And we can put an N here if you'd like, just so we remember it's for this, this particular step. Okay? Step two. Um, just a point here, if uh, n is equal to zero, uh, then we're going to go to step five, which we'll learn about in a minute. Okay, step three, we want to compute the measure of deformation. Right, so for this 1D problem, that was just the strain that we defined as the partial of the displacement with respect to the, the um, Lagrangian coordinate x, right, the material point. But it could be other things. It could be the stretch, the stretch tensor or anything like that. Um, once we have the measure of deformation, we can go ahead and compute the stresses by whatever constitutive equation we've defined. Okay, now having the deformation and the stresses defined, now we can go ahead and compute the internal nodal forces, that force vector. And we'll call that F. Remember, we're still at the element level. F sub e internal, right? 
and then you can expect the next step will be to compute the external forces. Okay, so Fe external. Again, these are all for time, for, for uh, increment n, right? These are going to change. And then once we have that, we can go ahead and compute the net force vector F, and I'll put an n there, is going to be equal to, right, uh, the external force vector that we computed minus the internal force vector. Okay. And then finally, we're going to go ahead and assemble those nodal forces to, to get back a global force vector. Okay, and we'll call that just f sub n. Okay, and, and I put an I put an E on here to remind you this is an element, and then we'll go into the global. Okay? So that's kind of a, a long step. The others won't be nearly as long. So step three, the whole goal here was to compute f sub n, right? So now we have that. Now we can go ahead and compute the accelerations. Uh, that's from equation nine. Okay? And then step four, once we have those accelerations, we can go ahead and uh, update the nodal velocities uh, from equation eight. Okay, now at this stage in step five, we're going to go ahead and enforce uh, any essential boundary conditions. Right, so that's going to be on anything that's on displacement or velocity. Then we can go ahead and update the nodal displacements or and that'll be from equation five. And then we go back and we go ahead and update our, our counter and time. Right, so that means that our, our n plus one now just goes to n, right? And our t plus delta t just goes to t. And then finally, we compute any outputs that we want. And uh, if we need to run again, we go back to step two. Okay, so this just iterates through time, stepping through time in, st in increments of delta t. Okay, let me give you some remarks about this. Okay, number one. In contrast to some linear analysis, we have to compute the force vector at every single time slash displacement increment, okay? Okay, let me say a little bit about something we haven't talked about. And, and I'm not, I'm just going to mention it here. We'll talk more in depth about it when we really focus on um, dynamics, okay? But most frequently, we're going to use what's called the lumped mass matrix uh, here. Okay, that's instead of what's the, called the consistent mass matrix uh, that we developed. Right, remember that that consistent mass matrix was, uh, if you remember the example we, we looked at, um, in the previous lecture, uh, it looked like a block diagonal. So it was kind of diagonal, but it was really uh, diagonal in terms of blocks of matrices. Um, the the lumped mass matrix is a fully diagonalized uh, mass matrix, so it's it only contains values on the diagonal. And we'll talk later about how to how to achieve that. So so just the lumped mat the lumped mass matrix is the diagonalization of the consistent mass matrix. Okay, number three. So, in the, so the, this solution, the equations of motion are just simply advanced in time. And, and what this means is that we don't need to, ha to have a solution to a system of equations. We don't have to invert the matrix and multiply like we would do for the linear analysis. Okay, sometimes we use this to our advantage. So a lot of times... Um, if we have nonlinearities that are particularly challenging to model with an implicit type of analysis, um, we use this explicit analysis because uh, it's going to gu guaranteed to give us an answer. Now, whether or not this is a converged answer, that remains to be seen, but it will give us an answer. And so a lot of times when we have uh, really nasty nonlinear problems, a lot of times you'll see people try to run these explicit analyses using some sort of a quasi-static approach because it... Um, it doesn't, it's not going to blow up on you, right? It's just, inter, it's just stepping these equations through in time as opposed to trying to invert something. Um, and so it, it's just, it's just, uh, be aware that this is a tool that's often used even when it's not a dynamic problem just to accommodate, um, uh, severe nonlinearities. Okay. There is a disadvantage to this method though. 
Okay. One disadvantage is that the time step that we have to use to get a reasonable solution, uh, it has to be very small. Okay. Okay. And when I say very small, I mean it has to be smaller than a critical value for stability. Okay. And that value is delta t must be smaller than l naught over c naught, right? Where this is. Uh, the element length, okay, and C naught is the wave speed in the element, right, and we remember we had defined that before as C naught squared was equal to E over rho naught, right, so uh, the, the modulus divided by the density gives us C naught squared, and you have to compute this value for every single element in the problem, right? And you have to take your smallest element basically is going to drive your time step. It's going to make your time step very small. So you can imagine that the, one of the challenges is that as you refine your mesh, not only do you now have more uh, elements to worry about, but you have to take smaller and smaller steps to make sure that uh, you're below this critical value for stability. And all that what this critical value is really doing for you is it's going to make sure that an elastic wave can't pass all the way through an element in a single um, time step. Okay. Okay. So that's this. This is actually a very easy method to implement. Um, like I say, it has its drawbacks. You have to take very, very small steps. So um, the couple advantages that I won't write down in the comments, but obviously um, because we're just stepping in time, this method actually paralyzes really well. Um, so, you know, running multiple processors with this method uh, speeds it up by, you know, it's, it's a, if you run four processors, they're going to typically run about four times uh, faster. Um, the other thing to be aware of is that you, you can, you can get a solution where sometimes the solution is not the right solution, right? So um, it's possible to get off course as you accumulate error uh, due to the, the, the many, many numbers of steps sometimes required to get a solution. Um, so just be aware of those things, but it's a, it's a, it's a straightforward method to implement and it's one that's used often in the case of uh, severe nonlinearity.